right. Well, I think I will call us to order, even if it may be one minute early, because I think everybody who needs to be here is here. Um, thank you to all the members of the Council and Board of Civil Authority for being here, because yeah, it's a lot of work, and I appreciate you all uh, being here. Uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. So I would understand. Is everyone okay with the agenda as written? Okay, great. Next item on the agenda is to elect a chair and a vice chair and we accept nominations. I'll nominate Jack. Second. For chair. For chair. Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for a chair? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. And next, nominations are open for vice chair. <laughs> volunteers. Yeah, are there any volunteers? Anyone who would like to do it? Okay. Oh, John. John. For vice chair. Any other takers? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. I didn't catch the second. It was very quiet. Second. Second. Oh. Yeah, both of you know, yeah. oh. yeah. I will. Rosie, Rosie, Rosie Dan. Yeah. Oh, okay. this one we all have. Um, this and next item on the agenda is to uh, adopt our rules of procedure. And this is the first for us. We've never really had rules of procedure before. Um, but, uh, but I think it's a good idea. They were all sent to you in your packets. And you can discuss them if you like, or the floor is just open for a motion. Mary. Well, so I'll move them, but I also have a question or a, a, a idea okay. that we adopt in the rules of procedure. Is there a second? second. Okay, Mary. Okay, Mary. And, and I was just wondering or thinking um, maybe we should just have a conversation about what a conflict of interest is. I think, I mean, the different boards have maybe different standards and maybe we all need to be on the same, have the same understanding of what that is. Sure. And I have no idea what it is. So. Uh -huh. Well, I have one proposal. Okay. If anybody has a grievance, they should be disqualified. Yeah, I, I think I think in fact that's in the statute that if you can right. if you have a if you filed an appeal you can't sit for any of them. Right. But other than that, the fact that all of us are property owners, or most of us are property owners, and our taxes might go up by some increment if someone else's taxes go down, that's not enough to create a conflict. Got a question, Jack, on uh, the part about 15 minutes the C3. Is that 15 minutes total for both the city and the appellates? That's the hope. And is there any division there? Um, <clears throat> I would expect the uh, taxpayer to use up most of that time. Okay. And you know, and we'll see how things go, but, that, but we've got a lot of cases to go through. And, and We've had occasions in the past, as you undoubtedly recall, where people have gone on for longer than they probably needed to to make their points. So. And I would assume if the need was, the board could decide to give more time, but at least it sets you up for an expectation that's you know, reasonable. Okay. I have a question um, on number seven. Are we, um, is there any circumstance when the uh, inspection by the group of not less than three would be waived, or are we anticipating that for every single one we're going to do it? We actually are anticipating that uh, there would be waivers of inspections in some cases, okay. including some of the bigger ones. Probably. Probably worth mentioning that that's only made possible because of the state of emergency. Um, that if the governor 
state of emergency stops, then at least my understanding of the statute is we have to have inspections for everything. Um, yes, Mary. Well, just back to the conflicts of interest. Okay. Um, I, I guess I would have a suggestion that if there's a thought that passes anybody's mind that they may have a conflict, that if just at the beginning of the hearing in which they have it, if they could just say, this is the case, and I do or don't think it's an issue, and you can just so that it's on the table and there's not subsequently a thought of, huh, why I should have said, or why did, or somebody thinking that we should have said. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I don't, I don't recall ever seeing it's a conflict been. come up in the previous year. But. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else? Are you ready for a vote? All those in favor of adopting the rules of procedure as uh, proposed signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. <clears throat> we are ready to go for our first appeal, and I think the first appeal is uh, James and Jean Atchison. Our, yes, Juana? And I'll put the where it is. I will solemnly affirm the testimony you're about to give, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Okay. All right, Mr. Atchison, or Atchison, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, we're, we're to you. We're going first, Marty, or? No, we got to go ahead. You go first. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Um, our concern is, at this hearing, is our evaluation of our property. Excuse right? me just a second. Are you picking him up? Okay, great. Right. And so our concern is with the valuation of our property and rather than the building. And what we have done with a prior document, our property value went up 171% over the prior value. And that in and of itself made it an outlier. So what we did is that we took um, I gathered together a sample of properties, and it turned out to be about an 87 different properties, which were similar to ours. We have a duplex on Spring Street, on the edge of La Meadows, um, and it's not where it's it's a rental unit. Both units are rentals, so we don't occupy either one. And so I gathered together information at the individual um, property value, property level, in order to have comparable properties to compare to. And you'll see in our document that you know, that's what, we came up with about 87 properties, and then we split them into groups to make them more comparable, and then calculated averages and so forth. So the front table is is that is the data that the graphs are then based on. Um, we so basically we had three graphs in our document, and um, basically the first one, which is on going to be on page two. This just shows that the increase of our property value is at the very top and, you know, therefore is an extreme value in terms of our property value, valuation. And so, you know, this is, I mean, basically what, it, what I wanted to do is I wanted to understand that. And so then I started to to look at the data in terms of in doing comparisons and particularly focusing on the property value per square foot, which should be a size neutral figure. And so the second graph is one where we're just showing the total 
property value per square foot. This is the bar graph, and it breaks it down into this. The three large groups that we were working with were our immediate neighborhood in Spring Street, and then properties in the meadows, and then properties from elsewhere in Montpelier. All these are, again, comparable properties. You know, by the, by the same type of neighborhood and the same kind of building, apartment buildings. And there are a few residential ones in there, purely residential, because those were in the immediate neighborhood. And I wanted to, you know, be able to have a group that was in our neighborhood, purely in our neighborhood. In the second, there are two things in terms of the bar graph. One is just, um, you can see on our, for the first bar, which is our own property, that the property value per square foot for our lot is higher than it is for anyone else. It's more than a quarter of the total property value per square foot. And the other thing on this graph is to point out that all the properties in the immediate neighborhood of Spring Street, our immediate neighborhood, have higher property values per square foot than other comparable properties in either the meadows or in other parts of Montpelier. Another thing that came out while I was working with these data is the fact that um, our property and the one next to us is <coughs> Excuse me. Are in exceptional in that they basically we have very little land relative to this, the footprint of the building. So I wanted to, and that seemed to have an effect on the property value per square foot. So then the, the third graph that shows is plotting the property the property value per square foot against a measure which is basically the ratio of the building square footage to the property square footage. And you will see on that that both our own property and the one next to us, um, 12 Spring Street, are like extreme outliers in terms of that. So our, again, concern is with that property valuation, not with the building valuation. Um, and we, I don't have an explanation, and, and nor do I think it's something that is, you know, that I find that I'm, being, I'm not being critical of the listers' job in terms of what they did, but I mean, I do know that there's an issue here, and you know, that's what the data are telling us. And our concern, you know, first of all, is uh, the overall change, just to sort of reiterate, is the overall change in our property value um, going up 171%. Our property value per square foot is $37 per square foot compared to every other thing in our sample, and, you know, which are down in mostly in the teens. Um, and. And the last thing, you know, I have a concern about buildings like ours where there is very small amount of property um, relative to the size, to the building size. And I think that there's um, a bias built into the system that I don't understand and I can understand, but I see that in the data. Um, so we, um, so that's what has brought us here, and you know what we would like to request is we think that our we should be we feel that our property value is inappropriately high, and what we would like to see our suggestion is that it be recalculated based on an average of, of other comparable Meadows properties. Um. I think people will have some questions. Thank you. Is that yeah, the end? I'm, okay, thanks. Yes, I think people will have some questions. I have a couple of questions. Do you, for, uh, for 
your property and for the other uh, parcels that you looked at, do you have the actual dollar uh, value of the land? Like, do you have the land value broken down separately? Yeah, I don't have that. It isn't in the table. Okay. Um, but, you know, because these are all the, um, you know, what's in the table are da data that are basically size neutral. You know, so there are percentages and there are per square footage mm -hmm. figures. But, you know, I'd be happy, more than happy to share with anyone the base data that this all came from. Yes. It was gathered from the, the listers, I don't know what you call it, Marty, the database, yeah. you know, that has individual property figures and called from there. Okay, thanks. Anyone else have any questions? Jack, I, I didn't really hear what you said. Is there a land value for all these other properties that they're showing, or is it said it's built into his table? It, it's all built, I think, I gather it's all built into the table. We have not got the land value either from this property or from the other values, or the other properties, although I'm sure the card will have the land okay. value. Yeah. There, yeah, and that's what I'm saying, is that there is base data. It's not showing in this document, which has been aggregated at the, that table has like, is like averages for the groups that we defined. Yeah, Mary, Mary, and then Rosie, and then uh, Donna. Um, thank you for doing such a thorough analysis. That's really super and very helpful in their understanding your thinking. Um, is the comparables that you're offering are to a large extent residential. I understand the argument. You're adjacent. You're in the meadow. Look at the meadow. Right. So I wonder if you had. Did you look at some of the listers comparables, which are outside of that area, which are looking at multiple family dwellings? And do you have a comment on that? Yeah. What well, we so you'll see that there are three larger groups. One is our immediate neighborhood of 12 Spring Street, and then there's Meadows Properties, and then there's the other category is like from all over Montpelier, outside of the, of the Meadows. So, and those were just based on the basic criteria, um, the kind of neighborhood, I'm not sure what you call it, but um, the field is, but you know, basically we, the initial group was just Cold based on the, on those th things that were typical of our own property. And in your scatter graph, I can read the, the yeah. names of some of them, except there's a cluster. Yeah, is the I'm other sorry. Other where we're seeing some yeah. of those other. Yeah, everything ties. It should you should be able to relate everything back to that initial table? Okay. Uh, Rosie. So my question was about what the actual addresses were that you drew on from the sample. And so uh, I see now that some of those are on the scattered chart, but it would be helpful to see. Okay. Thank you. Done. Well, I was confused when you said there wasn't a known land value when your chart lists a land value. And I, on your first, second page, uh, yeah. I wish these were numbered, but... And likewise, on your graph, you assign a certain amount to a land value. So somewhere that number exists. <coughs> there are land values on all properties. Yeah. I thought it was also on the, the city's listing that we have. It is. Okay. Yeah. So there, those that I'm working, what's showing there in terms of the values there per square foot? Okay. Okay. So it's a land value per square foot, and that neutralizes the fact the value of the. Right. Well, not in your case, but another one who covered the sheets from the city's work, it would list, this is the land value within the assessment. Yeah, they're all, on those city records, they're all broken down by land, okay. um, building. And so we can find that sheet for yeah. this property, because we do have it for Carpenter. That's where I found it. So maybe we need that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Carrie, you raising your hand? Okay. Okay. Marty, why don't I swear you in too? You solemnly affirm the testimony you're about to give in all the proceedings tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They do. Okay. <laughs>
Um, so for doing mass appraisals, um, there's three things that we have to focus on. Um, <clears throat> one is the property assessed fairly when compared to market value, you know, what are homes selling for? Um, is the property assessed equitably to the neighbors? And is the data factual? So we had a round of informal meetings back in May. So we were able to kind of get out all of the factual, uh, you know, wrong bedroom count, wrong square footage, just things like that. So everything I have, we believe it all to be factually true. So what I have done from here is I'm doing basically the same thing as Mr. Axton. I'm just running some comps. Um, and does everybody does everybody have a copy of my reports for tonight? Because I can oh, if I, I can pass them out. Copies. Would you, if you would, that would be great. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm comping his out his house um, to other multiple uh, family dwellings. There's a breakdown of these um, their property in particular, the size, the, the build. Um, a lot of the changes in here come based on depreciation. Um, so if you look on the first page, um, we're, we're breaking this down. We're comparing the property at 12 Spring Street to three homes that have sold. Um, when the city or when the when the appraisal contractor did the reappraisal, they did a three-year sales study starting from April 1 of 2020 to April 1 of 2023. They took all the sales, put them into a database. Um, and these three sales fell within that time period. Um, we have the sale price, year built, uh, square footages, and uh, a breakdown of the sales, what they sold for on a price per square foot, uh, along with the condition. You know, a lot of the um, average condition is going to be uh, a lower sale price. So I have comped it out to three homes that I find are pretty, pretty similar that have sold. Um, and they're all selling above $140 a square foot, which is what we have 12 Spring Street assessed at. That's the entire property. This isn't you know, a house and land. Um, and also it's important, like I said, to compare equitably to make sure that they are not over assessed uh, when compared to other similar properties. Um, and there's three other properties on the second page under the equity comparison section. And that also breaks down how much their assessment is uh, per square foot. Um, and you can see that they're, they fall pretty, they, they fall in line with uh, 12, 1012 Brown Street, 300 Elm Street. Those are multi-unit multi properties. Um, and there's also a sub note under there that Liberty Street has since sold for $90,000 over assessment. Uh, since this was printed out, um, so I think I think they're pretty uh, comparably assessed where they are at um, at three ninety nine four. Um, it matches out when you when you comp it out to sales and to equity. Uh, everything seems to fall in line. Um, so if anybody has any questions, fire away, Mister. Go ahead, Ken. Um, well, in page sorry, uh, two, sorry. would you explain what that last column is? What are the figures? Those are the square feet? The second page? Yes. Yes, sir. That's um, the, the condition of each one of the, uh, of the columns. Are, they're average, and it's a dollar, dollar per square foot um, assessed uh, to square foot. So you just divided the assessment by the number of square feet? Correct. And, that, and it's the same for the sales. Okay, do you look at um, the condition of the building? Um, these are all average. Correct. And yeah. that's pretty subjective, isn't it? Most of these were uh, viewed by the, the, appraisal, the reappraisal contractor, or it's based on um, if, we, if they were unable to get into the property, it's based on what the condition was given previously. Um, if, they, you know, if, if they disagree with the condition of the property, they had a chance to go through the formal grievance for us to go and inspect to change it. Okay. So some of it's historical, uh, historical data, but um, the appraisal contract, I believe, got into 75% of the parcels or properties. 
and one other question. One of the complaints here is Mr. Hatchinson says he has no yard. Mm -hmm. That seems to me like it means the building takes up most of the lot. Mm -hmm. So is that any kind of a factor in your thinking that lack of a yard? So they will they will make a, the, the, the reappraisal contractor will make adjustments for um, there's a plef there's um, sloping um, access issues right of ways. If they felt that there was uh, a need for a negative adjustment to a lot, they would make it. Um, but they're thinking when they comp these out is that they're similar to neighboring properties. They're all in that you know 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.15 acre lot. Yeah. And when when they sell, you don't see a huge discrepancy in sale price. So. Okay. Mary, thank you. Just want to confirm that what the the data that you're giving us is for multiple family homes, Correct. not yeah. yes. And I, I, I know we're a really small place, and there's not a lot of comps to draw on. Um, but to me, there's a difference in desirability, which I assume translates into income, and thus the assessment mm -hmm. um, between certain streets and other streets and it's can, can you comment on how that works sure into this? sure um, on the record cards themselves um, when you get to it the there's the these things are really really detailed uh, and they do go into um, detail about the, the property itself every neighborhood is given a designation um, this home is in what is considered early good so there's early good, there's early fair, there's, there's, a, there's a whole list of um, neighborhoods. And then what they do is they set a base rate of an acre of land in an early good neighborhood would sell for um, $160,000 if it was an acre of land. Because this lot is smaller, it's, that, it's, it takes value away. So every neighborhood has a designation and is given value. Uh, College Street is 250,000 an acre. Over here it's, Whatever I just said, 160,000 acres. So it, it is all broken down by neighborhood. And that's now, so are what you showed us all early good also? Probably not. We don't have enough. No, there's there's a difference. There there are differences in the neighborhood. Um, some of these are better. Um, East State Street is considered a good neighborhood also. Um, so those two, I don't remember the designation for Terrace Street. I think Terra Street they call traffic average just because of the traffic up there. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Carrie. So um, am I correct that we were not provided the property card and, and the materials that we got? Yeah, I think it would be good to have those. Oh, I'm happy to print them off next time. Yeah, Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, so, so then yeah, I just sure. have a, a, a bigger question about um, receiving information and how we're allowed to get like, I could look up the property card right now. Yes. Is that okay, or should I just be relying on what's provided to me by the assessor and by the appellant, rather than doing my own individual research? I don't think you're going to want to do your own research as well. I would assume, I don't think you want to be looking for the right Well, are you allowed to good. receive evidence outside of the, the, what's provided to us in the hearing? Yeah, generally, we've been told we're not supposed to accept evidence right. outside of the hearing, and so that means for instance, the committee goes out to visit the property. Uh, the person always wants to talk to us about stuff that they didn't say when they were in the hearing. That's technically not allowed either because it's evidence taken not, not outside of the hearing. Um, but I think, I think having the property card for every one of the properties is, is essential. And so what... I'm inclined to rule for purposes of, of tonight that we'll hold the evidence, hold the record open for all the properties that are on for tonight for the assessor to get us the property cards. And in the future to provide and in the them future to get all a, future yes. properties. Yes. Well, if a member has information, it, can they make an offer of putting it into evidence? What and then mean? we would vote on whether it could come in. Um, could you, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Kim. Well, apparently she has some evidence that she thinks is persuasive. 
in, the, in its written. Could that be circulated and we could decide whether we want to include that evidence? I think what she said was that she could right now look up the property card and, uh, and offer it. And so what I said was I'll just accept the property cards for all of tonight's properties uh, after we get done tonight. So we don't have to deal with that problem. All right. Uh, Donna, so so that's, that's confirming that we stick with the evidence we're presented. Yes. Okay. And if something should come up, we take it, what, to you? Yeah, I think and, so. And then, then you three can consider and then bring it to the At group. a subsequent hearing, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rosie and then Bob. So I just wanted to clarify, is early related to the age of the properties or related to it's an improving neighborhood? Typically, it's the age of the buildings. Okay. Typically, yeah. Great, thanks. But, yeah, mm -hmm. the question was when we're talking about evidence after the inspection committee goes out, is that considered evidence to us when they can give their report? I don't know if the, if the report is considered evidence, but as I think to a degree it is because the report, the inspection committee is often might be giving their own impression of what the property is like. Right. That's, I mean, that goes as part of the part of the report. Yeah, they may come out with a different measurement from the inspection yeah. committee, and you would think you would need to take right. that as evidence. As an obvious thing, they could go out and find a different number of bedrooms, and that that obviously goes into the report. Marty, okay. um, I have a question. Uh, in in previous years, we've heard about uh, we've heard a fair amount about. Uh, land values and how land values uh, work with regard to uh, real estate appraisals. And what the previous assessor regularly would say to us is that there's not that much variation of land value based on area or amenity or that kind of thing because the basic purpose of a land of the land is to support the structure and so a building lot is a building lot uh, maybe as you said varying for uh, different uh, different neighborhoods is that how you uh, see it it's been my experience uh, I am also a um, bank appraiser fee appraiser um, it's been my experience I've never I have very rarely seen a big a big difference in a tenth of an acre uh, 0.15 to you know, two tenths of an acre, a quarter of an acre. I don't really see a big difference in value. Um, people want to know that they have enough room for their house and their garage, and their and their deck. So I, I don't see a big difference. No. Mm -hmm. But but it is in the assessment. It is adjusted for the size. Uh huh. And do the, uh, the does it show up the different land uh, uh, lot sizes show up uh, much in uh, sales prices? Not dramatically, no. Okay. Again, I'm not talking like a difference between two acres and a quarter of an acre, but uh, typically anything over a building lot is, is excess, um, and then the, the dollar per square foot drop, you know, per square foot of, uh, of land drops. Um, I've seen it go from you know 120 thousand for the first acre to six thousand for anything additional. Um, so it's usually just considered excess land. Okay. Um, I, if I could just point out one more thing. Uh, we were talking about percent of increase, and I've done a lot of studying on this, um, and there's been a fluctuation of some people's ha homes have gone up 20%, some have gone up 100%, some have 70 The The percent of increase has been all over the place. Um, one of the things that we've found, some homes were under-assessed previously, so for them to get from 2010 values to, to 2023 values, there's been bigger jumps. Um, and so what we're trying to focus on is at the end of the day, is everybody where they're supposed to be, not how did they get here. You know, some people didn't take big jumps because they've been filing permits, they've been working on their house, their assessment's been creeping up. Um, I came across one that people put a quarter of a million dollars into the house, never filed one permit, so their, their jump was 120% because we caught them. And I'm not, I don't mean to suggest that here, but the, the, just the percent of increase has been all over the place. So at the end of the day, we want is, is the assessment where it should be? Not how did we get there, if, if that makes sense. Thanks. Any other, Sal? Uh, I wonder if we should uh, 
given the, the table uh, that's been presented, giving the uh, the average acreage of the land and the average square foot of the the average square foot cost, if in fact we do have the land value in the table <coughs> that we could confirm with the card, but we can just do the math here. Mm. If these numbers are accurate, we know about what the land value is. Well, I, I was trying to figure that out. Uh, do you? You could actually back and do it by <coughs> multiplying the acreage, turning that into square foot, and then multiplying by the the figures, the data that are in there. But you know, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, those you can get off. Uh, you can print those online. Those are the online reference cards. I was just uh, one of the other appellants. Uh, put on a copy of this online report, and it yeah. clearly breaks down. This is your land value, this is your total value. Yeah, no, I, so I, I think we need this for we, we the We were others. talking about not being able to use that, and I think maybe we can, because yeah. we actually have a way of determining it. We might as well go to the car. Yeah, I'll PDF, you know, whatever tomorrow, you know, for, for my stuff, um, you know, for, for what I present, right? Okay. Um, we need to appoint a committee. Can I ask one other question? Yes. I'm sorry. I don't. Uh, can, can you explain? He already had one adjustment. It started out at 434, and it went down to 399. Can you give us an idea of when you first met with him? What? So the first, meeting, the first meeting in June was with um, the, the reappraisal contractor. Um, I believe it was a condition adjustment. Um, they, felt, they felt like maybe they missed with that one. Um, he came in, and I think it was a, they made a condition adjustment. It went from. Does that mean the condition of the house, or? Yeah. So we, you know, we can. Um, somebody just said, you know, depreciation and, and, and um, condition are kind of subjective. One person can walk and say it's average. One person says it's average plus. You know, we, it, in the grand scheme of things, you're looking at all a whole bunch of properties. You focus in on and say, yeah, that one's off a little bit. So what's you know what's the anomaly here? So you can make an adjustment in condition. And I believe that's what they did in the first round. Mm. Yeah, and as you <clears throat> said, that was an adjustment to the prop to the value of the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, yeah. not the property. Yeah. Yeah. In our yeah. focus, yeah. there yeah. on the yeah. property. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'd just like to say. A, a couple of things. Actually, one is a question to Marty, Please. and that is that um, I believe, and I believe that the property next to ours, 15 Spring Street, mm -hmm. um, sold this this spring, and I'm not sure when, but it was probably April or May, and I believe that actually sold below the the assessed value. Okay, and that's something that I'd ask if you could. Check and make it yeah, as <clears throat> for as evidence it should be. Yeah. So one thing I believe I know what you're talking about, and so and I probably should have said this first, but what we're we have to we have to stop as of April first of this year. Um, anything that's sold after, like I, uh, one of the one of the comps here on um, uh, Brown Street and Liberty Street, they both sold after April first and they're not included. Uh, if you appeal again next year, then we'll bring in the one next year. And I think that thing, if I remember right, the house is in pretty rough shape. Yeah, I, think. I don't, I mean, yeah. I, I just see it from the outside, yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing is just to, we were talking about those neighborhood um, codes that they use too. And I just wanted to be clear that we took those into account when we were building our sample. So these are in comparable neighborhoods too, with the exception of, you know, the ones that are, um, well, Spring Street is the same, and I think there was one that was in a, a slightly different category um, in the meadows, and it just was comparable. And okay. included. But basically, the, those neighborhood factors have been taken into account in the groups that we set. Okay, great. Um, let's get three volunteers to serve on.
Well, that's an interesting that's thought. We've never done that. What if we ask the homeowner what works for them and then someone says, yeah, that's great. I, I think what we've done in the past is we've got the committee and then the committee just has to contact the homeowner and, yeah. and make it work. And soon people would volunteer when they're available. Well, it just it seems like it would make sense if somebody works nights and somebody, you know, <laughs> yeah. and we could set something up so that the group that is consistently available on Tuesday afternoons is all on one team that sees the same bunch of houses together. Um, that might be more efficient use of our time. I don't know how that would work. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think we just have to assume that we get a team, you know, that you've got almost a month to arrange the visit and write the report, and the homeowner has to make the place available. And, and just confirming, we have to do the, the three, the team has to do the site visit within 15 days of today, and then is it 15? 30 days from today that we submit the report, or 30 from the 15th? John? The, the deadlines are somewhat are on hold now because for two reasons. One, we're not having multiple meetings. This is all going to be one meeting that goes into recess. Um, that's at the advice of the League of Cities and Towns. Right. But also in the state of emergency, all those deadlines are doubled. So, so I don't need to be thinking, golly, I'm going to be unavailable for some period. Of, I'm trying to figure out when I can volunteer. And I don't want to leave people in the lurch. So we're not worried about the deadline. It's not a question. Okay. Bob and then in, Kim. In the past, I think we've had some visits where we couldn't all visit together. Are we saying we're not going to do that? I, I think that's okay. But you know, to the extent possible, we've done it right. all we've the time. Yeah. Possible, but sometimes it's just someone can't make that day and yep. they Go another time. They just don't have any communications separately from the group right. with yeah. the homeowner. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Kim. John mentioned earlier that uh, visit could be waived. I suppose the homeowner should be asked about that. Um, and I don't know what difference that would make, but some people may may not want an inspection, others do, but I don't know how you would make the decision. Well, I can tell you that uh, I've talked to the attorney for some of the uh, commercial properties who has said that he doesn't think it's necessary to do an inspection to address the uh, legal issues that he wants to raise in his appeal, just as one example. But I think in a situation like this, I think that I would be expecting there would be an inspection, like for this case. Even if you don't have to get inside, because the property owner isn't contesting anything about the house. Right. So, right. so yeah. why, why have an inspection? To look at the property. To, to look at the land. To look at the so land, yeah. You make an official report. It's in the law to have It's in the law. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point. point. <laughs> yeah, but it yeah. can be waived. It can be waived, but the... But the I mean, it, in my case, you know, it's, it's a rental property, and if people, and again, our concern is not with the building assessment, but with the, the property valuation. And we would be, I'm happy to meet with anyone and I work in Montpelier, live in Waterbury, so I would just, you know, um, and I live close by. I work close by so I can break away, have reasonable flexibility in breaking away. But if someone wants to just, you know, go there, you know, and walk around the property, then that's fine. Just let me know, you know, when you're going to do it so I can alert my renters and let them know that somebody will be coming yeah. by, mm -hmm. maybe coming by. Okay, so Mary, you're getting ready to volunteer. I'm volunteering. And volunteer. Carrie, and Sal. Okay. Okay, so great. We'll coordinate and yeah. let you know. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks for coming in. All right, thank you. Next up, we have Joseph Blatchford. OK, 
Okay, will you raise your right hand and solemnly affirm subject to the pains and penalties of perjury? The testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay, I, I, I noted that uh, our rules of procedure actually do have the uh, assessor going first. So, okay. why don't you give us a little sure. description? Um, okay, same, same thing as before. Um, we have uh, the initial value was set on the property of 446800 um, The property owner did come to the formal grievance by telephone. Uh, no changes were made. Uh, we have a brief description of the property. It's on a 0.28 acre lot on Terrace Street. Uh, the neighborhood is considered traffic good, so there is that traffic factor. Um, there's a description about the property that we have. Um, built in 1960, home is rated in good condition. There is 1,800 square feet of above grade finish. Uh, concrete basement is roughly 50% finish. Um, and I've comped it out to, <clears throat> excuse me, three, uh, three neighbor, neighboring properties. Um, as you can see, um, 29 Terrace, three Crest View, and 22 Pinewood. Um, the Important factors over on the right hand side the conditions and the uh, dollar per square foot that these homes have sold for when compared to the subject. Uh, the subject is, is assessed at $237 a square foot. Um, it is comparable to the first and second um, sale. Uh, number the, the first sale is a neighboring property and it's a recent sale. Um, so I think, I think that's probably the best. Uh, comparison as far as real estate goes, uh, real estate sales. Um, and as far as equity comparables, um, again, we've got three uh, three comparables with their assessments. Uh, these are equity comps, these are not sales. Um, 28 Terrace, again, that's a neighbor at $262 a square foot, so it's, it's a higher assessment than the subject property. Um, number three, pine, or, I'm sorry, the, the third, um, equity comp number eight Pinewood has an assessment of 316. Um, as I spoke earlier, um, anything after April 1st, I don't include it because that's the cutoff date for the grand list. Um, but eight Pinewood has since sold um, for $470,000. And that one is the, um, the price per square foot on that one is 272. So it's, it's below the three um, equity comps that I have. Um, so I feel that it's, it's compared um, reasonably when compared to market value and equitably when compared to neighbors. Um, okay, thanks. And that's it. Mr. Blashford. Um, I, um, I wouldn't argue that the assessment is correct. I, I doubt there's very few houses in Montpelier that would not sell for the assessed value or perhaps quite a bit above. Uh, I, I would argue that perhaps uh, a lot of my neighbors, their houses were under-assessed. Uh, you know, just all you had to do was thumb through the grand list and you could see that most houses went up 50, 60, 65%. Uh, mine went up 93%. And, uh, you know, it, and it was the highest in the neighborhood except for one house across the street which uh, was sold and a tremendous amount of work was done since the last uh, assessment. Uh, I bought our house in 2000, right after they, that assessment at, at 114,000. And in 2010, I was assessed at 230,800, over 100%, but I fully understood it because the house needed a lot of work. I had major foundation work. I put in a new heating system, a new deck, a new roof, a new driveway, and you know, work on the inside. So the overwhelming amount of work that uh, I put in the house was before 2010. And uh, it, it, it's just the comparable values compared to my neighbors. It, ours has skyrocketed. Now, as far as uh, Terrace Street goes, the, where we live, the traffic is terrible. It's, 
it's a, it's a truck route going all the way up. It's way worse. I consider it uh, the least desirable uh, area in our immediate neighborhood, and obviously many other neighborhoods are, are like the Meadow or other places are much quieter and much better. Uh, uh, you know, I would so, so if I could jump in, so are you saying that you don't think you, your house is worth what it, the current assessed value is? The, the way the market is, the way the market is, I'm sure that every house in the city, uh, unless they had major problems, would sell for at least whatever the assessed amount is. What I was saying is, if you consider 446A a fair number, then I would argue that many of my neighbors were underassessed, that their houses would uh, would go for more percentage-wise of the assessed value than ours would, um, especially on side streets. You know, places like Clarendon Ave and uh, Dairy Lane, Dunpatrick Circle, Deerfield Drive. Those are much more desirable neighborhoods. Pinewood. It's a very quiet, dead-end street. Okay. Um, I was really quite shocked to see that uh, my 0.28 acres was assessed at 98,000 when it's one of the smallest lots and, you know, many of my neighbors have bigger uh, lots and then I see some other neighbors that have substantial uh, amount of land, uh, good land, and their assessments uh, definitely don't reflect that. Okay, thanks. Anyone have any questions? Mary. I'm just back to the trying to understand kind of the neighborhood value and uh, Marty called it traffic good or something. I forget the terminology. But one of your comps was, which just looking at the data, not what we should not be looking at maybe after April 1st. Um, it makes sense to me that Pinewood would be a much higher value than, than on Terra Street, Mr. Blatchford's point about traffic and kind of the way that street is treated. Can you give us insight into kind of why that wouldn't be the case or why you have that as a comp? Yeah, that'll be reflected in the um, price per square foot. Yeah, um, right. Because um, the 22 Pinewood is going to sell for a lot more, 371 a square foot. Uh, we're the subjects at 237, the neighbors at 315, so that th those neighborhood discrepancies will show up in the uh, square foot, the dollar per square foot adjustment. And I would argue that Clarendon, which runs parallel with Terrace Street, uh, but has way less traffic, you know, that that would be the same argument there, not to mention some of the other upper side streets okay. and whatever. And that'll show let's, up. In let's the, see. If, if you, uh, yeah. Do we have other questions? Uh, Rosie, then Kim. I have a question about the letter you submitted. There's a reference here at the end to number two, and I didn't know if that was another address that you were referring to. Um, I'm sorry. I don't have a copy. I don't. Uh, here. Um, there you go. I don't know what you meant by number two. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Kim. Is 29 Terra Street right adjust, adjust, adjacent to you? It's, it's down a little bit, yeah. It's a, a couple doors down. The numbers, the odd and evens don't line up exactly hmm. correct. It's, it's across the street, right? We're, yes. But it seems to me... It, it's a little bit smaller than yours. Yes. And uh, they got a pretty good value when they sold it. Yes. Um, I don't know that much about the house, but I do know that the previous owner had put in a lot of work uh, shortly before she died because she intended on uh, using part of the house as an Airbnb. Uh, I know it's. Uh, I know it's got a much bigger lot, you know, much flatter. Um, but other than that, I don't really know 
that much about the house. That's something that maybe Steve and Wendy could elaborate on. And, you know. I wonder if the assessor has any comments on that. On the sale? Uh, I saw the, the pictures that I saw on the MLS, it looked like it was a much inferior condition to the subject. You know, um, as I'm sure Mr. Heaney can tell you, anytime there's a, a listing, I can look at the... Right. Uh, the subject house was not in good condition. It, it wasn't in as good, in my opinion, but the, the um, reappraisal contractor gave it a good condition, which would be the same as yours. Right. I mean, I... I uh, I remember when I heard how much the house was sold for, I was shocked. <laughs> but that's, you know, there's probably 10, 15 houses in the area have sold in the last two or three years, and mm -hmm. every one of them has surprised me about how much they sell for. So yep. my, my attitude going in uh, to this whole process was, it's like, you know, I know people that was like, there was no way they were going to let the assessors in. They didn't want anything to do with it. But with me, it was like, come on in, I got nothing to hide. Uh, uh, my thinking was, it's like, I didn't really care what my house was assessed at. I only cared how it was gonna affect my tax rate. And I never dreamed that mine would go up 93%, whereas most of my neighbors would be in the 50 to 60% range. Okay. Which um, so is that has, ja has jacked up our, uh, taxes considerably and um, and that's the part that I feel is unfair. Sure. Any other questions or should we just get volunteers for the committee? I'm happy to get I'll swear about it. Kim, Lauren, were you raising your hands, Lauren? Yeah. And Sal? All right. The committee will be in touch with you. Okay. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Yeah, we have some we can skip over. Let's see the carpenter, I think. Oh, great. Uh, Jenny Carpenter. Can you pass your sheets out now so I can have them when you're talking? Yeah. Maybe you can invite them in half. This one's coming. Okay, you solemnly affirm oh. subject to pains and penalties of perjury. Testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay, thanks for coming. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. All right, Jack. Yes. So, uh, this one, I feel like to refuse myself. I didn't realize I was on the BCA until last week, and Jack didn't call me earlier. <laughs> so we have talked. Okay. <laughs> but I never heard back from you. No. <laughs> <laughs> So she called to try to get you help with the appeal or something? I didn't know he was okay. on city council. Fair enough, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, Mr. Assessor. Um, okay, so same thing here. This one was a little trickier. It's a one bedroom home, which Ms. Carpenter is very um, strong to let me know. It, it is a one bedroom home. It, it was a, it's a tough one. Um, I did comp it out to a condo just, to, just because one bedroom homes do sell. Um, the, this, what I focus on with these is square footage. Um, a lot of times in my, in my um, experience, I have found that it's, a lot of people will take a two bedroom home, knock a wall down, turn it into one bedroom. It can be turned back into a two bedroom. So I'm focused more on square footage um, than I am the bedroom, because bedrooms can be remedied pretty simply. Um, I've got three good comps, plus the, plus the condo, you know, that's take it or leave it. I, I um, wouldn't put too much credence in it, but it's just to show that you know one bedroom homes do sell. Um, the assessment on the home is 352, 300. Um, that was the original value set by the reappraisal contractor. Um, we didn't see any uh, any need for change. The home is rated as average to good, so it's kept up in pretty good condition. Um, and so I found other average to good or good homes to comp it out to. Um, and as you see. They are, they are selling in the, uh, $253 a square foot on up to $371 a square foot. Uh, so I think the, the, comp, the, the subject at $349 per square foot um, of assessed value, it falls right in that range um, as far as sales. Um, so I feel like it's, it's um, comped out okay as far as um, sales go. Um, equity comps, 
you know, she's up in a good, um, they're up in a, a, a good neighborhood there. Um, we have that one. That one's a mid very good. Um, lot start up there at $140,000 an acre. Um, so we try to use other equity comps that are in similar neighborhoods. And as you'll see, they're in the, the 221 to 283 range. Um, and it is of noteworthy, which again, this is after April 1st, but there is a neighboring property that sold for 445. Um, and the assessment on that one is 322. Um, so one of the things that I do is I'm, I'm trying to show the trajectory of how the real estate market's going in Montpelier and it's not slowing down. Um, even though we are doing drop dead date of April 1st, anything afterwards is not considered, but it does show that the real estate market, it has been hot for three years and it hasn't really slowed down much. Um, so by putting that neighboring um, comp in there, I think it kind of shows how, how the real estate market's still going. Thanks. So. Ms. Carpenter. Yes. I'm here because my appraisal is higher than um, other comparable houses in my neighborhood and I just want to know why. And I want somebody to explain that. And um, you'll see I made a spreadsheet in my um, paperwork. Um, and you can see all these, I picked six homes that are comparable. One's on terrace, a couple on Clarendon, maybe Clarendon, one, two, three on Clarendon, and two on Hubbard Park. And if you look at my spreadsheet, um, you'll see that all of these other houses have what I have plus much more. And um, so the only thing I have more is my lot, but it's swampy, so. So I think what I've written, what I've got here is pretty self-explanatory that I, I just want to know why. So if a committee were to go out and expect you, you're getting this picture now, we appoint a committee and yep. they go out to look at the properties, you yep. would say that these other properties you list are, are good points of comparison for the committee to look at? Well, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, or I wouldn't have picked them. Sure. Uh huh. Anyone have any other questions? I just want to affirm that you're not contesting any of the information that is on your property card. No. You agree that that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's more just what your property is more relevant to the ones that you're showing us. Yeah. I just, I have what they have, plus they have so much more. Seven rooms, three bedrooms. Look at them all. They all have three bedrooms. What do I have? I have one. My bathroom is a three quarter bath because I don't have a tub. And um, I have the least square footage. And my, you can see from my spreadsheet that the assessed values are different, the difference in those. And I just feel like I have the smallest house, but it's assessed the highest. Mm -hmm. And I know that Marty told me that um, assessed values are determined by using a three-year study of all market value transactions in the city and are applied to each property. So I'd love to see that study. That's behind the scenes in the computer. I can, pro I can try to extract it. And if it's someone could explain it to me, why, why mine is way up here and the others are much lower. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I do have a, a question about the this, uh, the square footage, the price per square footage. I understand, but is there is there some way to, um, a one bedroom house is not just I, I'm not sure it makes sense to apply just a standard math formula to a one bedroom house compared to a three bedroom house because there's just the value of a three bedroom house with a family in it. Sure. The one bedroom is, um, it's not just that it's, it's a smaller square footage, it's the, how you can use the house. If you so I'm wondering how that factors in and your comparables, aside from the, um, 
the one that I think is a condo, yes. do not, they all have more than one bedroom. And they do, but they're all in the same square foot range. So if you're talking, you know, you're talking about a, um, a three-bedroom home. If you have a three-bedroom home, then you're probably going to jump up to at least 1,500 square feet. Uh, and like I said before, when you're in that thousand square foot, 900, you know, bedroom walls can be put up easily. Um, I, I've seen, I don't know how many times over the years, people taking a three-bedroom home, turning it into a two or a one by knocking a wall down. Walls come up, they go down. So. I personally was not in this carpenter's home. I don't know the situation. Could it be turned into a two bedroom? I, I don't know, I honestly don't know. But it, you know, these are all the closest sales I can find uh, in the size. Does that make sense at all? I mean, yeah. bedrooms can be added. Do you know how many one bedroom houses there are in the city? Uh, when I was running comps on this, there was I brought 20. you. I brought you. Most some. of them are condos. Uh, yeah, most of them are condos. There are a bunch of a one bedroom, one bath that I brought to his attention. Uh huh. Yeah. And mine just was over all of them. Yeah, I believe those were little older homes. There was a tiny home in there. Um, I, don't I don't know. They had what I had and more. Yeah. Okay. Another thing I will throw out there, my house. I love my little house. It's a cute little house. It's a prefab. When I purchased it, it was a prefab. So um, I'm just disagreeing with mm -hmm. this. And does the fact that a house is a prefabricated house have a bearing on uh, sale prices? In my experience, I've never seen, um, if you're talking about manufactured, and modular, yes, absolutely, all day long. And modular homes, I lived in one, I had one for years, I've never seen a sale price difference. Okay. And I'm not disputing what I, I talked, when I talked with Marty about, oh, you could get so much more for it. Well, that's just not the point. The point is it the way it's assessed compared to these other comparable properties in the neighborhood. So that's why I'm here tonight. All right, thanks. Do we have three volunteers? Yeah. Does the oh, sorry. Um, square footage include the garage? No. No. <clears throat> Any other questions? Are we ready to go to volunteers? Mary, Bob, and Donna. Um, can I don't I have a volunteer for any? Oh, okay. I don't know their names. Could I get those, please? Mm -hmm. Rosie can do it, yep. Mary, what's your last name? Hooper. Hooper. And? Bob Gross. I'm sorry? Bob Gross. Bob Gross. Rosie Kruger. Thank you. So again, they'll be in touch with you to mm -hmm. arrange time to visit the property. OK, so. John, can we pass these out? Next time I'll do that before we move it. Sorry. Okay, next up. Um. Thank you. Rachel Charmer, could you pass me some? I don't know if you've got Oh, I did have one more question. Sure. Okay. Tell me about this. Um, Neighborhood codes. Yeah, so every neighborhood is given a designation so that they can differentiate. Um, so your. Mine's MV. Yeah, so yours is uh, mid very good and. What the, does the MV mean? Uh, mid very good. So what they do is they will set up, uh, based on sales, what um, land is selling for in each neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Land in Montpelier doesn't sell a lot, so it's just kind of sometimes it can be um, an extraction method. Mm -hmm. um, so an acre of land in your neighborhood would sell for $140,000, but because of the size of it, it's adjusted down to 119 mm -hmm. So neighborhood codes are given to come up with values for the, for the land. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank I, you. I just want to say, I think what I've presented to you is very self-explanatory, and um, I hope you will reconsider. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Okay, Frank and Rachel Carabo. Um.
Okay, do you... Oh, it's just get, get, get settled. You solemnly affirm subject to the pains and penalties of perjury. The testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Great. Okay. So ask the assessor to go first. This is a weird one. Yeah, so the subject lot was, um, it did have a home on it years ago. It is a 0.12 acre lot of land on River Street with contamination. Um, the report dates back to, I don't remember on the exact, exactly when it was on the property, but there is a, a contamination report being 10 to 15 feet of, um, uh, of contamination. The, Does that mean 10 to 15 feet deep or 10 to 15? Below the surface. Area. Okay. Yeah, 10, 10 to 15 feet below the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, the previous assessment on it was $2,200. Uh, the reappraisal contractor bumped it up to $4,300 given the fact that there is contamination there. Um, I have attached with all of the handouts a list of 140, 145 plus or minus sites in Montpelier alone that have some sort of contamination. Um, we all know about the form of car lot. We all know the contamination stories there. It's 148 sites that are um, currently either being monitored or they were discovered and taken and, and remediated. Uh, a lot of them date back to the USTs, underground storage tanks when they used to put um, uh, heating oil in underground storage tanks. Um, the first, there's, there's five of them that have homes on them now that are or were part of the contamination report. Um, and there are equity comps that show that there are people that still live on homes with uh, some sort of contamination on them. The list should be attached um, to that. There is a substantial adjustment made for the contamination. Um, the neighborhood code over there is um, uh, traffic heavy because it is on River Street. We all know how River Street is right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, a building lot over there would sell for 65000 but because of the contamination, there's a 90% deduction in value um, for the contamination, which brings it down to $4,300. Um, I did dig through old records, and I don't see anything about the city paying the taxes on the said property. Um, the city has been receiving tax payments from the appellant um, all along, um, so I I think that's about it for this, for this parcel. Thanks. All right. There were no taxes on it in the beginning. The only time it was taxed is when you started. Um, hmm. I mean, the contamination was bad enough that our house was destroyed and the dirt was lugged off in a specific way because it was so contaminated. Um, it, couldn't, it wasn't fit to live in. I don't see why it's still on the grand list. I mean, it's not saleable. We tried to sell it years ago to somebody that was buying the house next door. Their attorney wouldn't let them take that responsibility on. Um, so it's your opinion that the property is worth zero? Yes. It was supposed to be taken off the grand list. We appealed it before. And the Marty's assessor death. just said that You've been paying taxes on it right along, is that right? Once that Marty started giving it a value, we appealed it then too. I, um, we went back in records and found that there's been payments regularly made. Oh, sorry. Uh, tax, a tax payment has been made on the property. That's Not why I assume very it's beginning. taxable. Somebody's been sending tax payment money. Yes, I paid the taxes, but there was no taxes in the very beginning when this thing happened. There was, there's a lot that's on Berlin Street that sat above us. It had two underground tanks, one gasoline and one oil. And they weren't careful and they punctured both those tanks, which ran down in our basement. So is this the lot, like, kind of right at the point between Berlin Street and River Street? No, it's there was a house, uh, that about used to three be there. down. Okay. Okay. And there's no parking left. When they filled in that lot, the driveway went away. It was just a really tiny one-car driveway anyway, but it's gone. Okay, do we have any uh, questions? What, what can that lot be used for? Yeah. Are there any zoning restrictions on that? I, that's not, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. 
Good question. Um, Nobody's going to buy it. Kim. How do you know that it's remedial? How do I know it's what? And there are any studies that show that the contamination is remedial and at what cost? I don't know. I don't know if it's been remediated. I know that there are. Um, you just there, made a statement that it was remedial. No, I said that the list. There is a list of parcels that have had contamination that have been remediated. This I don't one's know never this been one. remediated. But this property, you don't make that. Statement. I don't know if that one has been. No, it has not. The state was going to put in this system and only turn it on if they needed to, but they never did that. They decide to. They decided to just. You know demolish the, the whole building. It was never remediated. And I think, I think the question that Kim was asking was, do we know if it would be possible to remediate this property? And I have to check with the state of Vermont. It would cost a know. lot of money. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that would make it, would that right. be listed in the brownfields? Would the state have this property listed? Uh, I don't know. Fields? I have attached what I think are all of the contaminated sites in the state. Because it's not in here that the state doesn't go. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, Mary. Um, Marty, you said that there was a downward adjustment. I think you said because of the contamination. Correct. Um, of 90%. Why, why 90, why not 50 or 100%? That's determined by the contractor, and I assume, I don't know, but I assume that's something they extracted from the sales study. I, I don't know for sure, but those are adjustments. Is so, there a way we can know what their assumptions were? Um, well, that's not what the state is asking. I can look into it. Yeah, I, I can look into it. It strikes me that, that there, there must have been some basis for making a decision of that nature, as in, golly, it will just cost, and I'm exaggerating to make a point, you know, $10,000 to remediate the site so it has a value, or it would cost $10 million to re remediate the site and it has a different value. Yeah, I don't and think they look into the cost to remediate. But somehow that goes to what the value, how developable it is. And isn't that part of how you would assess a piece of property? So what I think they're saying here is that there's only 10% um, of it usable because it, it has to be it has to be assessed at something. So 90% of it is currently unbuildable because of the contamination. Yeah. That's the way I understand. It. Something could it be assessed? At, could you do a 99% deduction? Honestly, I've never had, I've never done one, so I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. Why can't it just be written off the grand list? Yeah, Bob, is that 90% what was used in the 2010 appraisal and they just <coughs> continued with it? I'm just wondering. Good question. Do you know um, that? Or? I don't have the 2010. Reappraise. I don't have the 2010 property record card with me. And um, I know I'm it's. To look that up. I know it's not safe to grow anything on to eat because we were told that by the state. I mean, I just don't know who would buy it, who would want it, who wants that responsibility. The city was supposed to so take I, ownership of it. I remember discussing this property at some point in the past. And, but I don't remember exactly when it was. Maybe it was 2010, and I don't remember exactly what we did or what the outcome was. And I'm wondering if we have any records anywhere. We the appealed last time then. Came before this body, and what the circumstances were, what the deduction, the, yeah. the reduction was, and what the decision was that was made. That would be helpful to me to know. I looked through the record cards for any decisions that were made um, previously on this. Um, I spoke briefly to Bill Fraser about it, um, and I did go to Beverly. Hill, and she said she's been, that's why um, we decided to afford with it, because she said someone has been paying taxes on it. So we What else could I do? You it. billed me. Did you not me not to pay it? This has been going on for years. What they I know, me. but it's enough. It's enough. It's time but, to but, stop. But what he's saying is 
uh, Marty, the assessor, has has not been in his position for years, and so when you said, "Well, this you only started getting billed for it when Marty was the assessor," well, he's only been in the job for a year. Who was the assessor way back? He didn't bill us. Well, I, I can't tell. There have been enough. There's been a sequence of assessors. I I can't tell, but uh, okay. who might have started uh, char uh, sending you a bill and the. It's not the assessor that sends the bill, it's the tax collector, but it seems like there's some research that could be done. I mean, if you find somebody to buy it, I'll sell it. <laughs> I don't want it anymore. I don't want the responsibility of had it. It was a horrible process. Well, all the workers got sick. We were trying to do work on the basement. All the workers got sick. It had to be shut down. Uh -huh. Kim. Just procedural. Can the assessor come in and give us new evidence? If you, like, can we, do you want to instruct him to go back and find out more about the history of what happened here? I guess we could instruct him and we or could say we're convinced. To. I mean, somebody come in here and tell me that they don't have any idea what it would cost. Uh, I'm ready to go with the, uh, the fellow. I don't know why we need to give them the chance to go out and get such obvious information. I don't want the property in my name anymore. The city needs to take ownership of it. Mary. I can understand how really frustrating this, yeah. this must be. I think there are kind of two issues here. What, what is there a proper value that should be placed on it is one. And then there's the, I'm imagining that you could also separately, unassociated with what we're doing here, say to the city, is there a way that you can take this off the tax rolls or do something about it? But that would, and that, I don't know if that would be through the abatement process, but there may be, there, there are two separate questions. And, and our job is to figure out what the right value is. I'm a little stuck in trying to figure out if there's a value and what it is because we don't have all of the information, which is kind of to Kim's point. We can either go with what we have before us and we could ask for more research. Um, and, and, and then the other part of it is that in a property tax appeal, there is an assessment appeal. The taxpayer has the burden of proof, and they have the burden of proving that the uh, yeah. assessor is wrong and that it, it should be some value other than what the uh, assessor says it is. And that ultimately comes down to, after we have an inspection of the property and a report, what does this body vote for what we determine the the market value of the property is. And so I think that's, I think the points are very. <laughs> From my point, I just don't get it. I mean, who's going to buy it? You want to, can yep. you find me a buyer? Well, there's a list of over 100 parcels on here that do have contamination that have sold or have people living on them. So there is value to it. It's just, you know, we try to figure out what that value we is. We tried to sell it. No attorney would let their client take it. <clears throat> okay. So I want to volunteer to be on this committee. Mary, Sal, and I'm sorry. Mark. Mark. Okay. Great. I think we're set on this one. Okay. Thank you. You'll, you will be here in the Okay. Thank you. All right. Steve and Wendy Dale. Subject to the pains and penalties of perjury, the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. All right. All right. Um, similar to the other property we had on Terrace Street, um, the, the Dale home at 28 Terrace Street was given an initial assessment of uh, $391,500. 
Uh, we did see the property owner for the informal and formal grievances. Uh, no changes were made. The home is a one-story ranch built in about 1957. It's rated in good condition. It uh, has 1,494 square feet of finish. Uh, they have one full bathroom, a three-quarter bath, and four bedrooms. The basement is 85% finished. The home is graded as C, so it's, a, it's an average build, but it's in good condition. Um, the three homes that, it, um, that I comped it out to um, are the neighbor at 29 Terrace Street uh, that we were speaking about earlier, the home that um, um, the previous owner was rumored to be selling for an Airbnb. Um, that one sold at $410,000 or $315 a square foot. It's also in good condition um, when compared to the subject at $262 a square foot. Um, the other two are also in the neighborhood at $375,402,000. They are in slightly inferior condition. Um, but the, the 22 Pinewood, the um, price per square foot is going to be higher because it's smaller. Uh, equity comps on the next page. Uh, again, we have two neighbors, um, 30 and 32 Terrace. They're, they're coming in at 235 and $350 a square foot, um, respectively. Um, the subject is assessed at $262 a square foot. Um, eight Pinewood, again, um, it's after April 1, but again, it shows the trajectory of the real estate market. Um, that one is comped out, at, uh, it's assessed at $272 a square foot. Um, so it appears that based on equity comps and sales comparison, uh, I feel like the home is equitably and fairly assessed at $391,500. Okay, thanks. I, I didn't hear the two, uh, you said the two comparables are 29 Terrace and? Um, I have, oh, oh, I didn't see this, yeah. okay, thank you. So on the first page there you have 29, your neighbor, and um, three Crest View and two Pinewood Road. 22 binary road. 22 binary, sorry. Okay. 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 Um, thank you all for the opportunity. Um, I, I, as I sit and look at you all uh, doing this work, uh, thanks for doing the hard work of the people of Montpelier. I know this isn't, uh, this probably isn't fun duty. Um, we lived in Montpelier for 38 years. We lived in the same house. Uh, never have appealed an assessment before. Our last appraised value was set at $208,900. Uh, when viewed in the context of neighboring properties, that was a fair appraisal. Um, the current proposal is three ninety one five. dollars um, That figure relative to the values in the neighborhood is not fair, nor is it reasonable. And I'm, I'm um, interested in the, this comparable sales information because it's a little slant and a little snapshot of a couple things um, when, in fact, there are many properties in our neighborhood, uh, houses that were built the same time our house was built, um, all with on the first floor, three bedrooms and one bath on the top floor, and with varying configurations on the downstairs floor. So there's many comparables, and there are many that are um, in a whole different class uh, in terms of the, the, the dollars. So I, uh, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, but before I get into the specifics of those, there were two things I wanted to mention. Um, for context, well, one of them echoes the comments of Joe Blatchford. Um, normally, I, I don't worry about these things um, if, if proportion, it's all proportional. And um, but um, our our uh, rate went, our, our appraisal went up 87.4 percent, and the average in the city is 53 or something closer to that. Um, and most of the houses in our neighborhood went up in the neighborhood of 48 to 55. So my question is, why? And um, that's, um, it, it ought to be apparent um, why that is. Obviously, if you put on an, uh, an addition, um, 
uh, you know, there are things that are obvious that, that um, alter your relativity with your neighbors. Um, but nevertheless, um, the second um, big issue is concerns about clarity in the process. Um, I've been pouring through all the information that you guys make available online, and thank goodness it's all there, and you can spend endless hours um, looking at those things. Um, and I had the occasion to speak with Marty, who was very helpful. Um, but it is not clear to me how, um, how this formula works and which variables make the big difference. Um, so we had this whole discussion about neighborhood codes a few minutes ago. And our neighborhood code is XG. And so there is no, there is no key to the codes that I can find. And I called Marty and asked him, and he said there was not really a key to the codes. I said, is there a hierarchy of the keys to the codes? Like from most desirable to least desirable, because I'm assuming the purpose of the codes is to sort of grade. Um, we live 30, our house is 30 feet from Terrace Street. Stand out there at eight o'clock in the morning, and it is a thoroughfare. Um, and the dirt that accumulates in our kitchen from the trucks and the buses and everything else going, I love Terra Street, I love Montpelier. I'm not um, in any way too great. I'm glad I live where I live. But when you're looking at compar comparables, and we are very familiar with Pinewood, which is one block away from us, which has a double cul-de-sac and no tra zero traffic, um, how that isn't a significant factor is not clear to me. And how it is that you can't go on the website and say, here is the uh, hierarchy of desirability of classifications. So I don't know what XG means, and I don't know what it means relative to all the other codes, and there's like many codes. <laughs> um, and I, I love the early whatever and later and traffic, good traffic. On one of these sheets it says traffic good on Terrace Street. I said, yeah, it is, traffic is really good because there's a lot of it. Um, so if I understood it and if I understood what impact it made on the formula, I would probably be making a case to you about that, but I don't know enough about it. So I'm just, I'm, I'm suggesting that the board might want to ask for those codes so that you can determine relativity. Um, a second concern in terms of the process is this notion of depreciation level. When I talked to Marty, he had indicated that our house was in uh, pretty good shape and that we had a depreciation level of 14.9%. I said, relative to what? There, you will not find that figure in any of the stuff on the website, at least I couldn't find it, on any other property. So when I was doing the comparables, I couldn't say, Mine's 14.9, but my neighbor's 21, and the other neighbor's 32. I mean, maybe it's there somewhere, but I couldn't find it in any of the information available on the website. So it's a number that may be of significance. I'm not sure if it is, and I'm not sure how it plays into the formula. So if mine's 14.9, and I was going to make the case that, boy, relative to some criteria, it's really 25, and if that's going to make a substantial difference, then would want to have that discussion here. But I don't know what it means. So um, I, I'm thinking that Marty implied that our, our house is in better shape than many, and um, so therefore our depreciation is only 14.9, but I don't know what that means. So um, because I can't really get into those items, I want to just share two, uh, the two issues that I put in the letter that we sent to you. Um, first of all, um, the way I read all the materials I believe there's an error in um, the data relative to our house. It says on one, I've, I have all that information. I think I gave it all to you again. Um, it says that we have four bedrooms and two baths on the first floor level. We only have three bedrooms and one bath on the first floor. We do have other spaces on the, the lower level, the below grade level. If you look at probably the 50, 60 houses built during the, the period 57 to 65, um, you will find countless properties that have that formula. You'll see them all there. Three, three bedrooms on the first floor, one, one bath. 
And then there's a whole lot of stuff that is below the level, but it's not clear to me in the, um, all the data that's available how any of that is weighted. So ours says four bedrooms and two baths. Um, we have three bedrooms on the, first, uh, on, the, on the first floor. We have three bedrooms on the first floor. We do have a finished bedroom downstairs. But I know for a fact that there are houses on Pinewood that are rated maybe $80,000 less that have bedrooms downstairs, and they show three and one. So there is an, I, I believe there is an error in the data, and there's certainly an error in, our, in ours. And I know of one very well that has two bedrooms downstairs. So they got the, the um, but there's no real mention of that. So, um, so that's sort of the first question, mistake in the data. The second is um, uh, our assessment comparable to others. And so I listed a number of others which um, are not in Marty's list. Um, first of all, I will mention on Marty's list, 29 Terrace Street is a bed and breakfast. It was a bed and breakfast. She completed, she completely finished the lower level and it was an operating bed and breakfast. In fact, we rented it a few times for family members. Um, so I'm not sure it's comparable. Um, bed and breakfast is different than Airbnb though. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but it has a full a kitchen. Family it, family. It's upstairs, this is a single family home, but the downstairs is a, is a fully completed functional apartment that people can, that people rent and has kitchen and bedroom and a uh, living room and a fireplace and so on and so forth. So um, it's not really comparable. Um, the, um, but the ones that I listed here, I'm gonna start with um, eight Pinewood. And by the way, I'm assuming this isn't about increasing anybody else's taxes. This is about, <laughs> this is about comparing, uh, because that's what really matters here is Comparability. So Pinewood Road is a double cul-de-sac, has no traffic, generally larger lots, um, some much larger lots, and their structure is the same as ours, built in the same time frame, and in some cases by the same builder. Um, so Pinewood shows three bedrooms and one bath on the first floor, and we know for a fact there are two finished bedrooms downstairs in that building. The lot is much larger than ours, twice as, much, twice as large, much quieter street, their appraised value in this process is 316400 Ours is 391500 I would ask you, say, I don't know how your process works because you're, you're welcome to come to our house and we'd love to have you come and, and look. And, and our house is a nice house. But the point I'm making is relativity with our neighbors, not, not whether you like our house or whether it might sell for 390 if somebody put it on the market tomorrow. Um, uh, the, the issue is comparability. 316 is, it's big. Two Pine Road Road, right next to, right at the end of the, of the cul-de-sac, a big lot, 7.78 acres. Um, again, three beds on, on the top, one bath. I don't know what their downstairs look like, but the structure of the house is such that it has a functional downstairs. Um, but I don't know how you judge these things. The, when, when I, where people haven't been in the house, um, I don't, and I don't know where that data is in the, I, I, I tried to figure out um, the, the, um, the, on the web exactly how you describe lower level, I talk about percentage that's complete or, or percentage that's finished. Um, but the question is, is it bedrooms, bathrooms, or storage, or big living, or whatever it is? Um, so it looked to me like there wasn't a lot of analysis on the, the lower. Their, their appraisal, 312.8. 10 Pinewood, right next door to 8 Pinewood. Three bedrooms, one bath on the main level. You can, when you stand in front of the house, there's a garage underneath part of the house, and there is what appears to be a bedroom window and an entrance to the left. Don't know, I can't swear to it, but, my, but their appraisal is 281, 280,100. 18 Pinewood shows four bedrooms and one bath on the main level. Um, may well be another bedroom in there. Um, but again, their appraised value with the four and the one, 332.4. 21 Pinewood, you know, you can see, you can just go right down through here, 317.6. Um, one Crestview, which is down the street from us, four houses, um, shows four bedrooms and one bath. 
Praise value 328, 43 Terra Street, which is right across the street from Crestview. Three bedrooms and one bath, praise value 313.5. So I'm asking the question about um, we're being told, we, the, the data says four bedrooms and two baths. Um, and uh, and then it has our appraisal at 391.5. And there's all these other properties that may not have sold in the last year and may not show up on here. Um, but uh, that are all in the more in the 320 category, which is about a 53% increase in the in the uh, the in the uh, appraisal from the previous one, as opposed to 87. So I can't I don't understand where the 87 came from, um, and I would make these two cases to you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, one technical question: uh, Do you? How many bedrooms do you have in the house? Is it four bedrooms? It is four bedrooms. And it has three bedrooms upstairs. And the fourth one is in the lower level. It's under. It's below grade level. Below grade level. And on is the that, concrete floor. Are there uh, two means of egress, or is from there, the house? From the from the bedroom downstairs. Two means of egress. Is um, it a window and a door? Usually. There. Yeah. Yes. There's a window in the bedroom. Okay. Yeah. As there isn't. All these houses I've been gotcha. describing that are built into the into the Pinewood side and so, on the terrace side. So that can be counted as a bedroom because it has a bit, window that's big enough for someone to climb out of. If they need to. Right, but so do these other houses that I'm describing too. My point is not, I, I don't. I mean, my house is my house. We have four bedrooms, we have two baths, and um, but <laughs> it's like most of the other houses on our street. Okay. I can tell you the way it's supposed to work is. Um, the square footage that will show up on your car is, is above grade. The room count is the total house. That's the way it's supposed to. S some, some things may have slipped through. There may be bedroom counts that are incorrect. That's the way it's supposed to work is the, uh, the room count that's on your record card is all of them in the basement. But there is also a separate line for the finish. So, but it's at a lower value. Uh, in, in, um, in bank work, anything below grade is adjusted all as one. For some reason, I don't know why, but with city work, it's separated out. So, the, so the room count should be total of the entire property. But they're 1,494 square feet, the finished area. That's only the above grade level. Gotcha. Yeah. That's correct. Any other questions? Um, I oh, just ahead. to help you, um, you were you were sure. wondering about track uh, neighborhood codes uh -huh. um, that can be parsed out on the on the property record cards online. You can um, you can search for those. Um, I've, I've, you can find the what it, what they mean. It says they all say neighborhood code X G M V G. Print right on, you know, and you can and you can um, you can sort it by all X G. No, I did I did, G's. but it, oh. but the question is, what does it mean? Oh. And is one more desirable than the other? Does one mean that your taxes are higher than another? Should I contest that? So is it a is it a significant variable or is it a Insignificant variable. Yeah, I guess um, you know one way to, to to parse out desirability is you can you can sort it by order. Um, so you would probably find that College Street would be at the top of the list, uh, right on down. But the how do you know it's the top of the order? So the the, the, the assessed value would be higher. Okay, I, we this shouldn't be a <laughs> this shouldn't be a game to figure it out. I mean, it ought to be. If it's an if it's not an important variable, we shouldn't even have it on there. If it's important and if it makes a difference in your appraisal, you ought to know what it means. It That's all. Well, and if someone were to call me up, it'll it'll say right on their record card. It, it tells you exactly what it is. Um, XG is traffic good. Traffic good, MG but what does that mean? What's traffic bad? If, it means if, you have high traffic, but you're in a good neighborhood. I think so, I have a question that might help this. Somewhere, point you know, it's, it's not on this list, but somewhere there must be documentation for the program that creates this uh, I'm sure there system. Is. Like I, I think I got got it for the camera system one time years ago. But so in that documentation, you could probably find like a table of like, all the all the neighborhood codes and what they mean. Is that yeah. accurate? I can find it. If if it's if it's an important variable that changes it, we ought to know what they mean. And traffic good does not communicate it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, well, it does because there's traffic average, traffic fair. 
It, it still doesn't communicate. I, I mean, I'm, talk, I'm talking about the receiver, not the center. It does not mean anything to a citizen that says, oh, my neighborhood's traffic good. What does that mean? You're saying it's traffic bad, but good neighborhood. I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. But I didn't know what it meant, and I didn't even know it when you told me. So I, it's just feedback. I don't want to argue or debate. Great. Yeah. And one other thing you were talking about is um, um, depreciation. depreciation. We were talking about two comps because um, we gave your home pretty low depreciation, fourteen percent, like you said, um, and you were comping it out to number eight Pinewood. Uh -huh. um, number eight Pinewood has twice the amount of depreciation. Just that's the that's the condition that they, the the. Um, the assess the reappraisal contractor came up with, um, and that makes a fifty thousand dollar difference in assessment. So that's where you're going to see a lot of the disparity, is because you do have a nice home, and, and you had admitted as much on the phone. So, so I still have the question that I don't believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe the depreciation figure is generally available. If if so, if you were to call me up and say, Here's no, I'm the talking cost. about on the on the website. It may not be on the website, but it's I can send it to anybody. It's all public record. Okay, but because it wasn't on the website, and because I was preparing for this appeal, and I don't know what it's relative to. So fourteen point nine percent, okay, but is really good two percent, or is really good twenty percent, um, and based on what? I mean, is it like just? Looking and I say that's twenty. That's a twenty percent, or that's a ten percent, or there's some criteria. Upkeep and construction. A new, a brand new home is going to have, you know, it's going to have an excellent rating. It's going to have zero depreciation. Um, as a home starts to age, if you did nothing to your home, you'd probably be in the, the fifty to sixty to seventy percent depreciation because you've done the work to it. So a lot of it is, um, it, it is a little subjective, but there is a science to it. And as I remember. Um, this, I think it's interesting to be discussing some of these points at the very beginning of our process because these things seem to come up over and over again. But as I, as I remember, there, were, there was a figure for physical depreciation and then there's a separate figure called economic depreciation. Sure. And I don't remember what, what uh, the difference was. There's, there's different ways to apply depreciation. You can apply um, physical depreciation if you're, not, if you're not keeping up your home. Economic can be, uh, that's typically seen with a business if there's some sort of a, an impact like flooding that's having an economic impact on the property. Um, you can have an external obsolescence. We're gonna talk about that um, at the next meeting with someone who lives across the street from a, a, an undesirable subdivision. So there's an adjustment for that as well. So there, there are three different types of adjustments. Thanks. Any other questions? Rosie, you then Bob. Um, a couple of questions. Um, so one is, or is there a disagreement now about the accuracy of the property record? Or is it, and there was originally the argument that the, the card is wrong and it should be listed as three, but we're hearing that there are four bedrooms and Marty is saying that it is accurate to list it as four, even though some of them are above or below grade. Is that Marty hearing this? There's nothing inaccurate about the property record. Correct. Okay. So, excuse me. Can I? Yeah. Just um, if that if the description is the description um, of my house, I don't contest that. However, I know there are houses that are showing as three and one that have below grade with double with two forms of e two places of egress. In fact, I would guess there are many in my neighborhood. If that is a big factor in this, I'm not sure how you all as a board get a handle on that because you're not checking other people's places that you're checking on mine. But it is a serious issue in a neighborhood that's all built into hillsides with the same dynamic. I, so I just, I, it's, it would be patently un, unfair to list mine as four and one and not the next door neighbor or the people in the next block. Be, you're showing them as three and one because nobody looked at it, nobody paid attention to it. I'm not sure why, but it's it's a problem. It's an unfair problem. There could be some that have slipped through the crack for sure. Um, my predecessor was very good at keeping track of permitting, uh, the permitting process anytime. Homes were renovated or bedrooms were added. He did update the record card. 
Um, and like I said before, the reappraisal contractor got into 75-ish percent of the homes. Um, so I believe them to be accurate. If they're not, then we certainly correct them as, as we find these things out. The grand list is like, a, it's, a, it's a working thing. It's always evolving. There's always changes to be made. And some of these could have slipped through. Bob and then Tim. Okay. Oh, sorry, Rosie, go ahead. Um, so you raised another issue in your letter, which is about your garage encroaching on the adjacent property. Are you saying that the garage is built on the adjacent property or is just closer than? Yes. So if you, I mean, I, again, I, it, if, if this is um, measurements on the, you know, if this is all about measurements, the measurements are accurate. 0.26 acres is what I have. What is not clear, if you were to walk into our, some of you may walk into our house, and you look at our backyard, we have a nice big backyard. But a big chunk of my backyard, including a corner of a garage that was built in the early 60s, long before we were here, um, was on state land at the time, used to be state land. Then the city built a pumping station and ran its pipes down along our yard and has an easement for, for the pumping station that's that again, you would think it's our backyard if you were to look at our backyard, but it's, it, it was on the state's land with the city easement. Then the city sold Redstone to uh, Alan uh, Goldman a few years ago, and he now owns that chunk. So I don't, if, if, it's, if the property value is determined based solely on measurements, um, that is the right measurement. But the fact that, um, our, chunk of our backyard and a little piece of our garage um, have uh, issues. Um, it's, uh, it, it may affect value. I don't know what will happen someday when we sell our house, but um, I don't know how you take that into account. Yeah, I mean, a map, if, if, if you were to send a map over or something, we would certainly I have, parse that out. Oh, yes, I have maps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. But, yeah, the question I have is, it's back to the number of bedrooms again. The finished area that 1494 only includes the three of the bedrooms? That's correct. And so, how do they, is, will the card show us what the value is for that below grade bedroom? It has broken down, yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, Tim. Oh, I thought, I thought I saw you raise your hand. Uh, okay. Any other questions from anybody? I, I, I don't see okay. the answer to that question. I don't, I'm looking at this card. I don't see. I can show you where it is. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah Mary. So, Marty, you said that the contractor hit about 75% about of the home of the properties. Are there any neighborhoods where like there was a refusal rate that is significant? Do you have a reason? So I'm trying to get at the issue that Mr. Dale was raising of, golly, I know for a fact a bunch of my neighbors are off. Do you know if our contractors you know, manage to get into most of those properties and, and this is a fair because we can't look at them, but we can kind of have a sense of fairness here. Yeah, the contractor never came to me and said, man, I'm really having trouble getting to College Street, or, uh, you know, really, Berry Street's giving me trouble. It was very um, hit or miss. Uh, apartments were tough. Um, on each record card, there will be a record of um, the day that they were there and whether they gained access or not. Every, every, every parcel has that data on them. Yes. Um, right. Marty, can you just describe like how big of a difference in the ultimate assessment is the number of bedrooms versus the square feet? Just because earlier with the one bedroom house, you seem to argue that the square feet matters a lot more. I would I would say I've never seen a difference in three three bedrooms, four bedrooms, two bedrooms. It's it's all about the square footage. It, the the value is in the, in the per square foot. Um, so they just the way it's broken down yeah. is the, the total amount of, of bedrooms whether it's below grade or above grade, are all piled into one. Um, and then there is a separate um, line, which I'll show you where the, the value of the basement is given. Hmm. So you're saying that a 
two buildings with the same, the same approximately the same square feet. One of them has two bedrooms, one of them has four bedrooms. Would sell for the same amount? I've personally never seen a difference. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but I've never, in my years, I've never seen a difference. Okay. It seems counterintuitive. It does, it does, it, it absolutely, yeah. Well, other than when you go to a house, you see some people come in a bedroom that's really a little study, and you scratch your head and say, where you take walls down, I mean, mm -hmm. it's really square footage that makes you allow to create more space. Than you <clears throat> okay, are we ready to appoint the committee? One, two, and more. Oh, we got we got the you you already are on one, right, brother? I am. Yeah, okay. go for it. That was Lauren. Yeah. Okay, and I think that is it for tonight. So now we can recess. Recess. So next Thursday.